So we're joined on the line by the former Republic of Ireland International and the current Bristol City Assistant Manager, Curtis Fleming. Good evening, Curtis. How are you, Nathan? How are you doing? I'm OK. So you're on to discuss the story surrounding the former Crawley Town Manager, John Yems, who earlier this month was banned from football for 18 months after he admitted to one charge and was found guilty of 11 other charges of racist abuse towards his players. And the FA report was published earlier this week. It said that Yems used offensive, racist and Islamophobic language and joked that a Muslim player was a terrorist. The full details are... Fairly shocking, they describe how Yems used a racial slur to describe some of the club's black players, deliberately mispronounced a name to make it sound like a racially offensive term. He used a racial stereotype to two black players who were playing darts. One player failed, feigned illness in order to avoid coming into the club because of his banter about him eating curry. A Muslim player became the subject of jokes about being a terrorist. He was asked if he slept with a gun, if he carried a bomb in his bag. He used racial stereotypes uh, around jerk chicken, a dish associated with the Caribbean. And it goes even further than that. He called black players Zulu warriors, referred to an Asian player as a suicide bomber, and even uh, deliberately mispronounced Arnold Schwarzenegger's name, so it ended sounding like the N-word. Uh, remarkably, despite all of that, the FA Disciplinary Commission accepted that Mr. Yems was not a conscious racist. Nevertheless, Mr. Yems' banter undoubtedly came across to the victims and others as offensive, racist, and Islamophobic. Uh, Curtis, I said there the details of what John Yem said are are shocking and I was certainly stunned that that sort of behaviour could still exist within a club. Uh, You're still very much involved with football. Were you shocked reading the details of exactly what John Yem was accused of? Yes, I was. Um, Because I just think of all the work that's been gone inside for, you know, the inside of football at clubs, um, at some of the associations and, and saying what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. The biggest thing about what you're saying, Nathan, is you saying you were shocked. And it's brilliant that people are shocked by it. It's unacceptable. And, and banter, that's another thing. It makes me a little bit angry, if I'm honest. Um, whose banter is it? The person who's saying it thinks it's banter, does he? But did he really know what you know how the person on the receiving end of it's going to going to react, they're going to, going to feel? And I, I, I think the position that you're in as a manager or you're, you're, you're one of the, the decision makers at a club, you know, it's a, you're in a quite powerful position. And, and for me, you know, it looks a bit of bullying as well, knowing that maybe these lads can't come back and can't touch me. Uh, but it, it was that bad that the players got together and, and made the complaint, which is fantastic. Because years ago, I, I honestly would say that a lot of players wouldn't because they, they'd fear for their, their career in the future. Uh, could be branded a troublemaker, um, but it wouldn't have affected them, you know, and they wouldn't have said anything. So I think it's very brave. It's unacceptable what he did, and, and, and I think it's come out as well today that he's saying he needs an apology. So um, it, it's, it's a bit of crazy stuff for me. Uh, let's listen to that then. John Yems was on TalkSport earlier today with Jim White. Uh, Jim White obviously put the accusations and the allegations and the full details of the report to John Yems. Here's a little bit of what he had to say. Well, let's bring it right up to date, John. The commission accepted that you are not a conscious racist. John, what would you say to people this morning who'd push back on that, who would say, John Yems, we know what you are. You're racist. Um, Listen, to be quite honest with you, I don't know where this conscious racist is coming from because uh, it, it was, to me, it was cut and dry. And I, d- I don't really know the meaning of that. I've got to be quite honest with you. I'm not trying to be a ficko here. I just don't know what it's all about. I'm dragged through the, the worst experiences of my life in my total time in football. I've worked with black players. I've worked with white players. I've worked with every race. I've worked in most countries. And some of the things that I've been accused of saying, to me, to me... OK, some of them may be, they've said that I used old-fashioned language. I totally agree, but if that's the case, then that's the case. But it wasn't for me to be racist. Saying that to me when I was growing up, that's a terrible, terrible thing to say to somebody. And it's so easy to throw them accusations, because you throw enough mud and guess what, it will stick. And I find that very offensive to people to say I'm racist. But John, do you, do you to- not accept that you've done something wrong uh, particularly in terms of language that you've, you've used in the past? Um, no. 
No. The thing that I've done wrong has been highlighted to me, and it's shown me now that there's certain things that you can't say and do. Well, so be it. If that's the if that's the rules now, and if that's what we're supposed to do, then let people know. Is there anything you want to say this morning, John, to anyone out there who still thinks John Yems? No, he's a wrong one. Uh, <laughs> um. Well, people are do you want, do you want to apologise, John, for any offence that people, you people, clearly have people caused? Are out there, people are out there, they're going to say what they're going to say. People are out there and going to think what they're going to think. I'm only saying to you, have a look. I wasn't found to be racist. I never used racist language with intent. If anybody needs an apology, I think I do. The amount that I've, the abuse and everything that I've been getting, when people haven't even had the courtesy to ask me, I don't think nobody's even looked at the case with any any open-mindedness. And I think if you go in there, there's a few apologies that should be coming my way. That's a small part of the interview. You can hear the full thing on TalkSport's website now. I, I think to say he's a little bit tone-deaf there, Curtis would be putting it mildly if apologies are being handed out. I don't think he needs to be near the top of the queue. As more details come out of what he said, this... Old school seems to be the way he looks at it. He came up and was brought up a certain way, a little bit old school. His language is robust and industrial, and that's how he talks to every player. It's nothing to do with racism whatsoever. He talks to different players in different ways, and listen, it's football. Players need to be able to deal with it. And it's, 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 that's the biggest thing for me. I've written down here as I'm listening to him, I'm taking education. You need to educate himself on what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in society now. You know, everyone can go back to that. I remember, and you'll remember being, in, you know, being in company where someone has said a racist comment and said, "But it's okay, I've got black friends." So that was okay, was it? It wasn't about you. We've heard football fans chanting, you know, at stadiums, you know, you know, racist chants at some of the players in the opposition team where they have black players playing for them. That's unacceptable now. We know that. So the the, the argument that happened years ago and all that it doesn't happen now. It doesn't happen now. Another thing that jumped down was, well, if that's the rules now, what does that mean if that's the rules now? So I'll just avoid them while I'm doing my football and the rest of my life, I always do it. I can say what I want and do what I want. No, that's not acceptable. Football is a cross-section of society. It's a cross-section of everybody in the country. We have, I was in the dressing room, I was thinking about it today, Croatian, Colombian, Danish, Italian, German. Do you know what I mean? And, and that was the cross-section of, of probably Europe and of the world. And there was nothing said and nothing would be allowed to be said. Our manager, Brian Robson, would not let that be said because he knows it's wrong. It's something you wouldn't say himself. So how we can go down that? And you know acceptance of Ron doing is, is absolutely madness for me, craziness. That's and it's interesting. Something I think that, Curtis, just because it's, it's interesting there because I was going to ask you about, say, the current setup at Bristol City and uh, working with Nigel Pearson and the sort of training and conversations that might be happening because... What John Yems is trying to put across there is, well, actually, you say, you know, in the late 90s, nobody knew any better. These were the sort of conversations everyone was having at the time. And I've just I've just never stopped. I, you know, I, I still treat people the same now as I treat then. It wasn't against the law then. And nobody told me it was against the law now. What you're talking about there is actually within dressing rooms in that you were in as a player, actually, there was an understanding of what was and wasn't acceptable. No, there's no doubt about it, Nathan, and it wouldn't happen. It would never happen in any of the dressing rooms that I that I was in as a player and as a coach, working with a lot of managers, with Breeden Holloway, with Tommy Pulis, with Dougie Freeman, with Craig Hignett. That wouldn't have been acceptable in there, and, and the conversation wouldn't have happened. And I would have been shocked if it had have happened, and if it had happened, I would have said something, but it never did. So you're saying that it's acceptable in the company or the dressing rooms that he was in. Now, I think if you're a manager... A lot of years ago, you think about how many players might be, get a chance to become a professional player. You know, there's 92 clubs in, in, in England, you know, a professional club. So you get a chance to go into Crawley and you're going in and you're taking this, you know, abuse from me, from someone, as I said, in power. And you're thinking, oh, well, you can get away with one. Of one, it affects your life. Two, it affects the way you play. Three, you probably, you know, you lose the love of the game. So I think everything that he's done is against society, it's against the game, it's against everything that we all stand for at the moment. And the last thing that I wrote down here was, over the last year, how many times, Nathan, have, have 
as it come up on, on off the ball about racist incidents, Islamic, you know, Islamophobia incidents that we've all discussed happily. You know, one of the big ones in, in, in England here was, was about Saka getting, you know, when he missed the penalty. Mm. You know, and, and that was huge news. So please don't tell me, yeah, you think it's all right. I never heard that it wasn't all right. It's been, it's been in the headlines, it's been talked about the education. I work for show racing in Red Card. We go into schools, we go into to, uh, in the football clubs and we discuss. We don't go in and tell people what they have to think. We just tell them, this is what is acceptable in society. This, is, this isn't this really, is well, what's not. We educate them. What's your thoughts on that? Why would you think like that? So for me, listening to what he, he said there in his interview, there's no, there's no, is there any point in education? Because he's saying that he's not in the wrong. Everybody else is saying that he is. And I think that's the biggest thing. Don't get too hung up on him. We just have to all know that that's not right. And if you're listening to this now, or you've listened to what he's had to say today, that you think, I tell you what, that's unbelievable. He did also imply in that interview that there were four players who were let go from the club and maybe that was an underlying reason that these accusations suddenly came out. And as we saw and heard there, there's absolutely zero contrition, which makes it all the more remarkable, it feels, that the FA Disciplinary Committee decided that he was not a conscious racist. Now, I understand that they have to probably work within certain parameters and ultimately the difference between a conscious and unconscious racist in terms of suspension. If they decide and they rule that you are a conscious, conscious racist, it's probably going to be a permanent ban from football. But because, as they said, in his eyes, it was just banter. Uh, he was an unconscious racist. He was able to get away with what was just a 15-month ban. And the way football exists, would you rule out him ever working in football again? Would you rule out him ever working in football again from the football industry that you know? Well, there's no doubt. You know, I can't see anybody hiring. And if they did, it's going to, you know, it's going to cause absolute, you know, uh, major problems for whatever club it is. When you think about Claude, uh, Crawley sacking him, um, you know, really at the end of the day, if they had have heard that, now maybe Crawley haven't, but could they have got in there earlier and, and to understand that there must have been people around and in the, the dressing rooms, in the canteens, on the buses that heard this sort of language being said and nothing was said because the manager was the man in power. The people have to pay and they have to work and they have to do that. We have to know now that Whatever he's doing is wrong, and, and it, you know that it's unacceptable for what happens. For him to get another job in football in the world, you know, it's great to say, you know, Nathan, we've heard it. You know, I've worked with black players, I've worked with Asian players, I've worked in different countries, I've worked with this. But have you shown those people the same respect? That's the biggest thing. If you, 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 you're calling people for the color of the skin, the nationality, the religion, then there's something wrong. So who now would take him in to do a job? And people say he's saying he thinks he's being victimised. What he doesn't know is that he has really put a real dark stain on, on football, on the game of football, because football isn't that. We're fighting every day. We're fighting every day to make it a more level playing field for, for coaches, for players. You know, if would you want to play football? Say you're a rising star, now. say you're a rising star and you're coming through. And you're playing and this coach, first coach you have, is calling you this and calling you that. Yeah, whether I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a very proud black Irishman. I'm very proud of it. But if someone saying to me, go back to your own country, what colour, look at you, look at this and say the N-word or something like that, that puts you off football. It's putting people off the game that we all love. So how he gets another job for me, I don't know. And, 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 and I think there would be the, the big protests, protests all over. I think he ends up getting in, going in anywhere else. Incidents like this do spark that conversation about the bigger picture of racism in football. But it is a very personal thing then for all of those players who were involved and are on the receiving end of it. You've been on this show before and spoke uh, very eloquently about the impact racist incidents had on you and that the words and that every use of a name was like a little slash of a knife. And reading some of the details, uh, the players aren't named personally, but player four was a 22-year-old half Indian, half Irish footballer. And he was the player who was so upset by the way Yems spoke to him that he was feigning illness 
so he wouldn't have to go back to the club. Like that's a, a career. That's a 22 year old who has had all the talent in the world to become a professional footballer who was doing everything right and then ended up in the wrong dressing room with the wrong man who was destroying his career with his words. Like that is the impact. And for that then to be ruled as uh, somehow as not being conscious racism, like the, the kick it out have been very strong that it's real kick in the teeth for for the victims here that sort of language been used in the ruling like there are people behind all of this for, for me Nathan I think the biggest thing that we've done and that we can do is have discussions like this that's the biggest thing that we can do we know one of the, 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 the associations uh, a panel have gone and met and said and then that shows that they're not in line with whatever, what everyone else is thinking in the game and outside of the game my heart goes out to somebody who's 22 who gets a chance. I was working in a shop in Tolga Street at 21, 22, hoping, dreaming that I might get a chance because everyone had said I should have gone and I shouldn't have. Now imagine I had gone over to Middlesbrough at that time and my first experience would have, had, would have been having a coach like that. Luckily enough for me, I hadn't. And it gave me a, a, a place to flourish. It gave me a safe haven away from my home to go and try and make my dream come true. That's what that guy is doing. He's taking dreams away. He's taking dreams away from some young young lad who's 22 who wants to go. And, and and he wants to play at Old Trafford. He wants to play for Ireland. That's what it is. And even deep down, the effect that it has on, you, on your health and your life uh, as it is, what is he doing now? Has he retired from football? What is he doing now? You know, so for me, that's how deep it runs. And I think that what, it, it, what this does is, yes, we don't agree with the ruling, but what we have done is we've opened it up. We've put it into the public forum. And now we're saying to them, are you sure? Are you really? Are you in line with the way society, with, it, with, it, with football is, as human beings, as, as a, an Irish guy, an Asian guy, an English guy? Are you really ruling that it's not conscious? Because I know that I wouldn't walk out on the street and say any of the things he said. And I think that's the biggest thing that we can do. So I think there's going to be major repercussions after this. How do you feel about that line in the report? And I, I keep going back to that uh, line about conscious racism, which basically seems to be the FA Commission saying that you can say something racist, but that doesn't make you a racist. Yeah, well, well, for me, it's... it's uh, <laughs> for me... To listen to that is, you know, we, we look up the board, we look up the people, we look up the people in the higher office for a way to to, to, to lead us. And uh, I know what I can say and what I wouldn't say. You know that as well, Nathan. You know what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So as soon as anything like that comes out of your mouth, it means it's inside you. It's deep in there. And at that moment in time, you thought it was okay to say that. So I think that is in you. You know, and it, whether it's down to education, we speak to a lot of kids. It's a wonderful thing. We go in and we speak to kids and they hear the words and they this and then we explain some of the words that they hear. And sometimes they go, go back and said, I said to my dad that that's not right. You can't say that. And the dad goes, really, can I not? OK. And that's what it is. And it's education and education because no one's born a racist. But for me, a 63-year-old man, saying the things he said to young men, aspiring athletes, aspiring youth, you know, aspiring kids who want to go on and have a good life and say, not just football. We're not talking about just football now, Nathan. We're talking about every workplace mm. in the world. We're talking about every workplace. How many, you know, how many kids are going to work and thinking, oh my God, I hope this eight hours flies around quick because I'm getting, I'm getting these racist comments or I'm being bullied from a religion, or I'm bullied, being bullied from my nationality. So that's what it is. And for people to say at 63, I know it doesn't matter what age, I'm only saying that because that's the age of John. But I, I just think it's it's something that you know you can't say, and you shouldn't say, and why you shouldn't say. There's enough information out there. There's enough forums. There's enough things on TV. There's enough things on social media. You can find anything out in 10 seconds. Yeah. So please, how they, say, how they say that they think that is, you know, unconscious or conscious, for me it's wrong. If it's said, it's meant. 
the line there where he was saying he didn't understand that term and uh, not been a bit of a thicko, again, trying to imply, well, listen, I'm just not educated enough to know about this, which I can't imagine is a line he used when he went into the interview with Crawley Town and said, I'm just not particularly educated about anything. He would have sold himself very, very well. There is a, a culture issue as well around the power of the manager. And as you say, this didn't go isolated. He he didn't take a player off into a dark corner and abuse them. He actually felt he felt very comfortable openly talking like this around the dressing room, around the training ground, around the club facilities. And that fear that is within clubs across all staff it seems of upsetting the manager. That you know, he has total power over the players. Uh, that's something that every club can learn from out of this. That actually you have to have a culture in place that people who are fearful, that they can speak openly. From what you're seeing around football, and this you can only talk from your own experiences, like is that culture still in place at a lot of clubs where the manager is the almighty and that they rule and that nobody ever dare step out of line? Or are clubs becoming a bit more, uh, more modern and like more modern workplaces and that there is proper HR procedures in place for a starter? I would come back to you that Nathan on both on, on both points is kind of a yes and a no. I think that the the managers now, especially with their with their uh, the the life term as a as a football manager at any club, need to go in and need to be in control and need to know what they're doing. Um, which again, I think is the manager will make a lot of decisions. He will. You know, a lot of managers will, will, will talk about what the club, what way the pathway is going to be for the club, the way they want the club. What is, you know, what what is this club all about? What do we stand for? And I think he, they have to live by that. So I do think that the managers are in a very, very powerful uh, position. You know, I, as I said to you, I've worked with a lot of managers. I've worked for, for you know, under a lot of managers, player and, and, and as a coach. The other thing I would say is that I think what's happened in a lot of football clubs now, there's a lot more dialogue. I think there's a lot more dialogue. I think people are more open now to talk and to speak up and to say things. I think years ago, it was at a lot of clubs, you just got on with it. You got the head down and you got on when you did. I'm not saying that it was racist or anything. What I'm saying is you just got your head on and you went. But now the clubs are a lot more open than they were. So I think that I would hope uh, especially in Bristol City now, and I, and I really believe that nothing like that could happen at our club, and that's from the ownership. They set the standards. The manager may go, may pass, but no one's bigger than the club, and the club have to do that. And then no one is bigger than the FA because the clubs can't do anything without the FA, without the Football Association, and they need to put an aesthetic guidelines out. They're saying they are, that they, they, they will be doing, but then if you put the guidelines out, you've got to make sure that they're in place and they're being adhered to. And I think for me, that again, that's another thing that opens up. We've got a panel. I hope this panel are questionable. I hope they can come out and say, this is what we thought. This is why we made the decision. And put it out there so we can all discuss it and look at it and say, OK, OK, you came for that. Can we discuss this? Because for a lot of people, 99.9% of, of anybody that's seen this or read this story or heard what's going on thinks it's wrong. So I think that for me, clubs are a lot more open. There is no doubt about it. Managers, though, are, have a lot of power. They have a lot of power. There's no doubt about it. But there's so many managers. That, you know, I don't know every manager, so I can't comment on them. But I'm telling you now that people I've worked with, I've played with players who are coaches now. I've played against players who are coaches, and I see them week in, week out. And I have no doubt that none of them would act mm. the way this man has acted. You said earlier it's it's good that we keep having these conversations and we need to keep having these conversations. Quite often when we're having them when they're we're focusing on specific incidents, the the final decision that's made by the authorities seems incredibly inadequate. So when it is racist abuse inside a stadium, it's your way for handing out a one match behind closed doors and a £20,000 fine. Like, it does feel as though while there is outrage among uh, your average person to this, that actually the authorities are still really reluctant to go in hard on this type of abuse. That's, I think that's the message that you get from uh, around Europe. I think, you know, the, the 
the English league seemed to be a bit stronger, especially a lot of the, the, the there's been a lot of problems in France, there's been a lot of problems uh, in in uh, in Italy. Uh, it's amazing, and um, I, I always tell the story nice of years ago. Um, I think it was Bentner, and it was Bentner pulled his shorts down mm. at the story in goal, and got, I think he got fined eighty thousand euros. And uh, a team in India, in, 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 in Italy, sorry, it was, uh, got fined fifteen thousand for racist chanting and monkey banners. But you know, so it was it was okay, you know, it was okay to, to, to chant monkey uh, uh, things at, at black players to, to big, have big banners and furl at the stadium. It was okay, it's fifteen thousand is grand. But if you pull your trousers down and your shorts down, fraction it's eighty thousand, and that showed to me where we were. It's getting better and it's getting, it's getting better, but is it where we want it to be? No. The only other thing I would say is we can't let it go. We've mm. got to keep knocking at that door. We've got to keep chipping away. You know, really, people just want to say, I'm asleep. It's grand. We want to keep it as it is. No, it can't, it can't stay as it is. It has to change. And we're the ones that are going to have to push it because we're not seeing enough action above us. We're seeing a lot of talk. And a lot of great ideas and a lot of reports coming out, but it's acting on them. Words are brilliant, but, you know, but words are nothing without action. So I think it's brilliant that all of these top associations, the top governing bodies of the sport that we love, coming out and saying, we're going to do this and go and do that. You better do it. You better do it or you have to do it. And if not, we're going to keep this forum going and we're going to keep knocking at the door, keep knocking at the door. I go back. I, I, when I, when I was, you know, working and uh, for a few of the anti-racist charities and I said, you know, when I was playing, when I played for Ireland, I always thought, when I used to look up, I used to see Chris Hewitt playing number two in an afro and he looked like me and he gave me a chance. You know, I was thinking, Jesus, you know, I've got a chance here to play for the country. It was unbelievable. Barack Obama did it. He said he'd never have a black president, but he, he, kept, he kept knocking at the door and he got in. And at the moment, we need to keep getting knocking at the door saying that this is unacceptable how can we make the game better they're always talking about making the game better but a lot of it's finance based mm. it's all about money how can we make the you know let's get let's try to improve the integrity of the game and of, of our life and I think society is trying to do that as well have you told Chris Hutton about the Barack Obama comparison no 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 I haven't I, I've told he'll, him he'll, he'll enjoy that one well, I've been a bit embarrassed, you know, because I've been with him a few times. Uh, I've been with him quite a bit, and I tell the story. He's looking at me, and he's probably looking and saying, "Jeez, am I that old?" You know <laughs> that, that I was looking at him, uh, which was which is unbelievable. But 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 those things, even even when you you don't think that you're having an effect on what you're doing, you know, you're, you're affecting one person. You're affecting two people, and, we're, and it's for the good. So for me, Nathan, I think it's, it's, it's a huge thing that we can't give up on it, and we have to keep putting it out there, and we have to keep saying what's right and what's wrong in the game that we love, instead of someone sat up in an ivory tower who doesn't really know what's going on down in the grassroots. You know, they're making huge decisions that affect the millions of people. And I think we just have to keep knocking at that door and saying, no, this is how society thinks. This is what the background of your, of your management team should look like. Not, not that you should, you should have a black face or you should have an Asian player or you should have, you know, a Muslim in you. What I'm saying is that everybody has an equal opportunity to go and succeed and go and try. And if you're not good enough for the job, you shouldn't get it. It should have nothing else to do with anything. Uh, Curtis, you've been brilliant to come on. Um, I know you're busy at the moment with the club as well. You're, you're enjoying life at Bristol City? I am indeed, yes. Yeah, we've won a couple of games, which is great. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's brilliant. We love it. When you're in first team football, there's always a bit of pressure, especially in the championship. There's two games every week, so you win two, you you cock a hoop, and if you lose two, you think, "Oh God, what's going to happen?" So, but um, but I love it, and um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it here. It's a real good city, real good club, and and uh, you know, we're working very very hard. We're bringing a lot of young lads through, which is brilliant. They were hungry to to do well, so going into work every day is really enjoyable. So, yeah, we'll keep uh, we'll keep plugging away here good stuff thanks as always Curtis no problem at all Nathan thanks